Welcome to a brand new episode of the Michelle Tafoya podcast. They are the chicks on the right. They've been with me before. They're with me again. Two really smart women who've been through a lot in life. They are Mock and Daisy, or Chicks on the Right, as they're often called. It's the name of their podcast. It's the name of their website. It's what they do. They're on the right. But we talk common sense today about the presidents of the Ivy League universities and how silly they looked on Capitol Hill, about Riley Gaines just being a force. And what is a woman, by the way, about the border and about the election in 2024? Who has their vote? We're going to find out next. It's time for the Michelle Tafoya podcast. Welcome back, Daisy. Welcome back, Mock. How are you guys? You Great. Chicks, how are you, good. you beautiful women. Um, <laughs> I love talking to you. And so we've got some topics today. And they're not just two of them happen to be sort of women centric. And that is not by design. That is just because of the climate we are living in. And it's um, it, it's it's crazy. But there, there are a number of things that are hot right now. And let's start with Riley Gaines. She is a formidable young woman, 23 years old, and she can speak to Congress as though she's been there for decades, right? So she goes to speak in front of Congress about how if you change Title IX, it's going to harm women, biological women. It's amazing that we have to distinguish, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Biological women. And Summer Lee, this this ranking member, had started her opening statements by saying this was, you know, transgender bigotry on display. To which Riley said, well, if this is transgender bigotry, then what you said in your opening statement is misogynist. And it, it ended in this wonderful kerfuffle that the <laughs> rep, that the congresswoman had to back out of. It was just tremendous uh, watching. We're likely going to be forced to listen to transphobic bigotry. Unsafe, unfair, and discriminatory practices towards women must stop. Inclusion cannot be prioritized over safety and fairness. And Ranking Member Lee, if my testi testimony makes me transphobic, then I believe your opening monologue makes you a misogynist. Um, Mock, let's start with you. Why the hell are we here? <laughs> Well, that's a great, that's a great question. That's a loaded question. How yeah. did we get here? My gosh. I mean, I, I feel like it goes so far back to just how much the education system has changed. And so, and how earlier and earlier and earlier our kids are getting introduced to these concepts and topics that they have absolutely no business being introduced to at such young ages. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if that's the sole root cause to put it in Kamala terms, but <laughs> it certainly has contributed to it. And so now everything we're, we're like living in sort of this real world, uh, the emperor's wearing no clothes moment where mm -hmm. everyone is afraid to say reality. And everyone is so afraid of offending these, these crazy blue haired people that we're just not speaking the truth. And I, I know Daisy agrees with me on this 100%. We don't, we're not going to engage in the delusion. And so these people who are, con who are convincing themselves that they're, you know, the opposite gender or that they're trans abled, like now people are making up disabilities. Yeah. All of these crazy things are just that they are crazy. And I, I think it, it is incumbent on all sane people to reject it outright. Yeah. And yeah. I don't, I don't Go ahead, speak. Daisy. I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I don't speak crazy. So <laughs> I guess maybe it's the Gen Xer in me. And I am raising, you know, I have a 34 year old and a 30 year old. Um, my 34 year old is a, is a girl, is a female, a biological female. A biological and then, woman. Yes. Right. Exactly. And then my 13 year old, our 13 year old, also a, a woman, a girl. And, and I don't speak crazy. And so when I, when we raise her, I tell her these things. I'm just like, listen, you don't, have to speak crazy either. You don't have to do this. And so the things that are going on where a lot of these kids who are being raised in this environment where a lot of people do talk crazy, it's like they're being conditioned to think that all of this stuff is okay. And I'm like, and she's an athlete. My daughter is a swimmer. Yes, she's a state level yes. swimmer. And so I'm like, you don't, 
have to put up with this crazy. And if there is a boy who's going to be swimming against her, which I imagine will probably happen one day, you know, we don't have to stand for that. We're not going to be in a position where, I mean, I know when Riley was faced with this, one of the things when we interviewed her, which is astounding to me, is that a lot of the parents sat there and they yeah. just, they just allowed that crap to happen. That's where we have to, as conservatives, especially, we have to start fighting back for our girls because, you know, girls can't take this on alone. They just can't. We have to speak with them. Not just as them. conservatives, though. I mean, I think it's just sane, common sense yes, human Michelle. beings. Mm -hmm. I, because once you enter the word conservative into it, some on the other side will go, oh, well, if it's a conservative thing, I want no part <laughs> of it. You know, th I, they will. But th I, I'm glad yes. you brought this up. And I want to dig deeper into this because my husband last night, uh, approached me and he said, now, look, we've, we've got a 15 year old daughter who is crazy about soccer, plays it at high school, plays basketball at high school. And he said, what if, you know, it turns out that the state high school league in our state and our school decided that a biological male presenting as a female could play on her soccer team and became the mm -hmm. starting goalie. What would we do? I have what? no doubt that will happen inevitably. Uh, no, yeah. I don't either, really. Um, although we're going to just hang on for the next three years and pray <laughs> that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right. But, it, but it's interesting to to for him to press this. What do you do? Because I have I say it very easily. Don't line up and compete. Don't do it. Don't yeah. give in to this. Parents have to. And he said, well, Michelle, if our daughter came to us and said, but mom, I really want to play soccer. I don't. Right. Care. What do you do then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, Either that's, the, one that's, you want to tackle that. Well, that's the problem <laughs> is that, you know, and I feel that too, Michelle, cause you know, my daughter has been swimming since she was seven. She's 13. Now I can't imagine if she was 18 and she was at a place where she was trying to get a scholarship or trying to like, yeah. what if she was, you know, an Olympic contender or something like that. And, you know, I do feel for those girls who have trained their whole lives. And then some boy who is just, you know, he sucks at swimming as a boy. And then he comes in and he says, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and decide I want to be a girl today. And then he starts kicking butt as a girl and swimming yeah. because he changes his gender. I mean, this, yeah. this is the thing. What do you say to that girl who's trained her whole life? Right. And then she's like, well, I'm going to just go ahead and bow out but because so I what want to do you say to your own kids, you guys, I mean, this is serious. Now, what if your, what if your daughter came to you and said, but I don't care, mom, I want to compete. I want to swim. I don't care if that this transgender is in the pool with me. What do you do then? Because are you going to be that parent? Now, I'm willing to be that parent, but <laughs> not if it embarrasses or shames my daughter. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we really have to put it, put ourselves in that position of what would we do? What would we really be willing to do? I know I'd be on the phone with every parent on the team. And I say, totally would be. I absolutely yeah. would. Be. Yeah. And yeah. I think, well, I think my daughter knows at this point I am that parent. <laughs> because she knows, you know, who I am. She knows what I do for a living. And so she right. knows I am already that parent who's probably going to, you know, I don't, I don't think it would embarrass her either because she just knows, you know, she's been raised by right. me. Yeah, but I do, thing. but I do know there are a lot of parents who are just unwilling to make ripples in the water, right? I mean, they're just unwilling to speak up, which is at the detriment of our girls I and it, to women's sports. And so we've got to start speaking up. You have to make waves. You, do, you just have to do that. Yeah. As parents. Uh, Mark, what do you think? Well, I mean, I completely agree. I'm, I'm, I, I consider, I, I'm actually really grateful. I, I hate that my kid is aging so quickly. So hmm. he's 18 now where, you know, he's been accepted to college. We're doing all that. And it just feels like everything has been this quick blur. I but know. at the same time, I'm so grateful that he's at the stage in his life right now where a lot of that is behind us. And I do, I mean, I, I, I know I actually said this to Daisy the other day and she was horrified because I'm normally the optimist. I'm like the yeah. cheerful, yay, everything's great person. But I actually said to her, I've reached a point now where the world is so, I want to cuss and I probably shouldn't on your show, no, but like I it is care. so, really? Bored. Okay. Say bored. It is Say bored. so <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> the world is so fucked up in so many ways that I, there, I have had these moments where I've thought, you know what, if my son came to me and said, I don't want kids. There would be a part of me that would be relieved. And that makes me so sad. As much as I want to, yeah. I know I hate that. I no, mean, I hate is. saying that, but, but it I, is that's sad. how I feel because it's so awful right now I know. for kids right. and, and what they're being expected to be exposed to. And it's just all so awful and painful that I have felt that way from time to time. I've really thought if he said that to me, I would be, 
I would be like, wow, that sucks. I'm not going to have grandkids. But at mm-hmm. the same time, man, is that saving me a whole lot of worry? You well, know, you know, and isn't that sad? Because a childhood should be like part of the best part of your right. life. Yeah. And Agreed. they are yes. ruining it for children. All right. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, speaking of that, um, let's move on to what happens when kids do get to college, because we've got some uh, Ivy League presidents who really looked so bad in that congressional <gasps> hearing earlier this week. So they were given opportunities again and again. Uh, President Gay of Harvard, uh, Mullen of Penn, and then the MIT professor whose name is escaping me at the moment. And they, they were given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to say, to condemn the cries for intifada that are happening on campus, right. the cries for Hamas that are happening on campus. They, they were, in a way, standing up for, they said, well, we're all about free speech. Well, wait a minute. I think being fat phobic at Harvard is a punishable offense. Right. I think. Yeah. Barry not to Weiss mention, mis- like not to mention misgendering. If they misgender, misgender somebody, oh my you, gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But mm-hmm. calling for from the river to the sea is freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. This That's is fine. so crazy, Mock. I, you know, and, and then, so what, when you were watching this and especially watching Elise Stefanik go after these women and give them the opportunities yeah. to say, this is wrong. What did you, what did, what was hitting you about all this? Uh, well, I was just, I was so glad that it was her doing the questioning, first of all, because she's, she's tough as nails and you could feel, I mean, I felt it like in my soul, her just disbelief at what she was hearing from these idiots that lead the premier colleges in the United States. It was extraordinary to watch it. And, and I think the reaction has been appropriately out, just full on outrage um, across the board. I mean, I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of people, well, except for maybe Sonny Hostin on The View, trying to defend the women that were saying, well, it depends on the context. No, it doesn't. It no, actually it really doesn't. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been real glad to see, you know, folks come out and say, big donors, for example, come out and say, you got these women need to resign. Yeah. I will not be spending another dime at this university until you yeah. actually own and are accountable for what you're saying. And the fact that the UPenn lady, what, um, what's her name? Liz McGill Liz or whatever. Liz McGill, let's, let's, before you go any further, I, we've got some sound from Liz McGill. Because in spite of the fact, ladies, that she had all these opportunities in front of Congress to say anything she wanted to say, to condemn this hate, she didn't get it done. So apparently nope. after she got back to, to, uh, to UPenn, uh, she must have heard some, you know, bad things because she had uh-huh. to come out with a statement, which uh, I think she posted on X. We're going to play it. Um, John Berg, my producer, is going to roll it for us so we can listen together to Liz McGill. <laughs> In that moment, I was focused on our university's longstanding policies aligned with the U.S. Constitution, which say that speech alone is not punishable. I was not focused on, but I should have been the irrefutable fact that a call for genocide of Jewish people is a call for some of the most terrible violence human beings can perpetrate. It's evil, plain and simple. I want to be clear. A call for genocide of Jewish people is threatening, deeply so. It is intentionally meant to terrify a people who have been subjected to pogroms and hatred for centuries and were the victims of mass genocide in the Holocaust. In my view, it would be harassment. (laughs) I know, right? We can cut her off now. Uh, Basically, she's admitting what she should have said in front of Congress, but now some other pressure came to bear, right? Mm -hmm. I love how um, people have suggested that these women were prepared by lawyers to just sit there and go, free speech, First Amendment, free speech, Constitution, free speech, free speech. Well, it mm-hmm. came back to bite them, Daisy. And I'm just yeah. wondering now, does this help her? Or do you think these women are going to be pressured to resign? I, I hope that they're pressured to resign because it wasn't her instinct to say, you know, this is 
awful. It's anti-Semitic. You know, this is ter- it was it wasn't her her initial instinct. It's like she had to be pressured into doing this apology. And I think a lot of that Which pressure it wasn't. She didn't apologize. We should point out. OK, there was you're no right. She did, you're right. I'm sorry. She, there was no actual apology, but it, she was pressured into doing this follow up, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to say. This follow up clarification, was. this right, the <laughs> clarification, this disingenuous clarification, which if you see her face, it's just it is so disingenuous. And so um, somebody told her to do this. And I would imagine a lot of it had to do with money because yes. I, and I hope that people will start pulling money from these um, universities that people will not hire students from these universities because th- this is a reckoning at this point, you know, with these, these universities across the country, you know, yes. when it comes to Harvard, MIT, Penn, a lot of these Ivies, they are, they're showing us who they really are. And they're, they've, been, they've bred, you know, anti-Semitism on their campuses. They bred, just straight up wokeism, liberalism, which is a cancer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I if I ever thought about sending my kid to an Ivy, there's no way I'd send my kid, my 13 yeah, year old to an if Ivy. They say to you, well, mom, I'm going to go play baseball at this really liberal school. And you go, OK, honey. Yeah. Come watch all your games. <laughs> I'm not paying for it. <laughs> well, sadly. <laughs> um, but you know what? Again, it's the it's the foundation you put in place for your kids. Uh, mm-hmm. And fortunately, I feel pretty. <laughs> Pray for me, ladies. I feel pretty good <laughs> about the foundation that's been laid for both my kids. But, um, Mock, I, I, let me read to you because we also now have a a statement from uh, President Gay of Harvard. There are some who have confused a right to free exp- expression with the idea that Harvard will condone calls for violence against Jewish students. Let me be clear. Calls for violence or genocide (laughs) against the Jewish community or any religious or ethnic group are vile. They have no place at Harvard. And those who threaten our Jewish students will be held to account. Why didn't she just say that in the first place? Well, that is the question. Is it because they were under oath and they didn't, they actually Ah. take an oath seriously Ah. and they didn't want to lie about what they really thought? These are, I mean, these are universities where there are students who like get all freaked out and need safe spaces if Ben Shapiro exactly. shows up. Mm-hmm. And yet there and, and and these are these are universities that will punish and discipline students who misgender someone. They will if if this was, you know, calls for gay people to be mass murdered or black people to be mass murdered, yes. these universities would step up and have no problem right. saying, of course that doesn't match our code. Oh, they have these kids. But arrested. for whatever yeah. reason, totally. yeah. yeah. Whatever reason, whenever it's about the Jews, everyone is all like, well, I mean, the context really matters it's here. It's okay, yeah. <laughs> it's, totally. it's anti-Semitism, full stop. Yeah, and then let me, the let me be clear thing is so funny to me because oh, it's like, God. are they taking notes from KJP? Because exactly. what is that? What <laughs> exactly. is that? Exactly. Yeah. Let, I, I, the only word missing there was crystal. Yeah, let me be crystal. <laughs> totally, clear. she was clear, but not quite crystal clear. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it, again, this is kind of like falls in the same classification as the the only silver lining of the COVID pandemic was that we saw what was going on in our kids' classrooms. Yes, the only silver lining of these protests is that we see who is stepping up and supporting them, and and people's true colors are showing. And you know, I, I, for anyone to defend that. To, for anyone to to look at this and say this is okay, that these people in Oakland, California, at a city council meeting said this stuff never happened. We don't have proof that any of this happened. God. These babies being beheaded, what is mm-hmm. and yet you have people showing the video on their phones and dancing around in the streets. I mean, we are in crazy world. Yeah, um, totally. It, it's it's I I say it all the time. It feels like we're just in freaking crazy world. Yeah, um, <laughs> totally. And no nowhere is that clearer, Daisy, than at at the border, at the southern border in particular. We had the highest level of crossings into Arizona in history, twelve thousand in one day. God. And you know now you finally have another couple of journalists joining the Fox journalists down there. Bill Malusian of Fox has done a tremendous job. He's been a consistent presence at the border uh, exposing this. CNN doesn't have anyone down there, but News Nation now does. And apparently some more local reporters are showing up and, and exposing this. But it feels like the toothpaste is out of the tube. Totally. And this is a massive national security threat when you look at all the different countries these many of them, just single men lining up, coming in. I, I, right. I am 
I am flabbergasted that this is going on and it's okay with the president of the United States. Yeah. I, I, well, it's by design, right? Cause I think there was that video that came out with him. Mayork is talking about like 10 years ago, they were talking about how oh, we just want all of them to just come right in. I mean, and video doesn't lie. They, this is by design. I think it's completely on purpose with purpose. And I live in Texas. So I, you know, I, my blood boils when I see a lot of these people like Mayorkas and they say, oh, the border's secure. Really? Well, come here and live because crime has gone up here in the state of Texas exponentially because of just opening the, I mean, we have no sovereignty anymore, none. And these people don't care. And so when I hear all these people who don't live in Texas and don't live in a border state, talk about how the border is secure, they have no idea because they live in their little bubbles, but it is starting to affect people that are not in yeah. border states. And it's like, welcome to the party, pal. Yeah. Cause we've been dealing with this for years and they get so mad when people like Abbott and DeSantis push some of these, they're not migrants. I hate it when people call them migrants. They're actually illegal aliens. They're illegal immigrants, uh, people who have broken the law to bust into our border. Right. But when these people get you know, shipped to other places and they get so mad, especially people in sanctuary cities, yeah. they get so mad when they're bus there, whatever, and they don't welcome them with open arms. I'm like, what? <laughs> don't be mad. You asked for this. You voted for this. You yeah. want this. Yes. And Mark, yeah. I think I think one of the things that we're seeing now is like in places like Chicago, people who voted in this current mayor of the city, yeah. people who voted in uh, the mayor of New York and seeing what sanctuary city really means. Exactly. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't see this coming. I guarantee you, if they saw this coming, they wouldn't have voted to be a sanctuary city because it's, it's, it's the, the supplies, the schools, the medical, the, 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 the space, it isn't there. Yeah. And, and so now like you said, every, I think more states are becoming border states, whether yes. they like it or not. So is, <sighs> what do you do now, though? What do you do now, Mox? Well, I mean, it's going to take a strong leader to come in and actually secure the border and stop giving this lip service. The, the, what makes me the craziest, because I know we're all just like, oh, it's so yeah. frazzling um, to even just think about the numbers. But but so much of it is Mayorkas and Biden trying to say that this is a humanitarian response. These are asylum seekers. So asylum seekers go through a specific process where they're allowed in and then they get a court date and then they can just wander around and like take advantage of all of our resources for years before they're ever seen. These are not asylum seekers. And the fact that they keep lying to everybody and trying to pretend yeah. that someone who had $10,000 to pay to some cartel member to get him to Colombia so that he could make the track from China to Colombia to the United States, that is not an asylum seeker. That is someone who's got the resources to take care of themselves wherever they are. So it's just a lie. And, and the fact that the number of illegals that have now poured over the border exceed half of the population in, in the United States, like in separate states, it falls somewhere right in the middle right now of the number of people that, for example, are in, I don't know, Nevada, like we're starting to get to the number of illegals actually equaling the population of several states. Right. That's huge. And people are just like, this is fine. This is it's like the dog. It's un, it's un, just yeah, it's completely like, it's unsustainable. Fine. It's completely it's, and totally like unsustainable. And I think from we're a, past yeah. unsustainable. Right. You know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. we're past that. I think we're we've been at a crisis level right. for quite some time. All right. So before we wrap up here and I could spend hours with you and we'll do it again. Um, <laughs> I want to just talk about where we are because we do need, we need someone different in the white house. We need someone who takes control, who does not allow himself to be controlled by uh, identity politics forces. That's all that we have going on there. It's just um, let's, and, and let's appease Iran and yes, appease is the right word. Um, so we had a we're down to four at the debate last night in Alabama. Trump wasn't there, so he's the fifth. Uh, Mock, let's start with you. What do you see happening here in 2024 with the election? Well, um, I see what I don't want to see, <laughs> which is because I'm a DeSantis fan and I have been for well before he ever announced that he was even going to run. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I, 
I just don't think that he has put a foot wrong and he's got so many results to show, um, you know, what he can do and what he's capable of doing. So it, it, there's a part of me that feels like I feel just like a, I'm going crazy because I can't believe that we have such a strong candidate who is likely not going to get anywhere near the nomination. So what I think will happen, at least if we're to believe the polls, is that Trump is going to be our guy. And then what is what is going to happen to him over these next several months during the whole campaign cycle? Like, is he going to be convicted? Is he going to serve any time? Like, I have no idea. But the fact that that's even a question and that we're looking again at the matchup of two 80 year olds mm-hmm. makes me crazy because we don't have to do that. And yet it's looking like that's exactly what we're going to do. Well, yeah. Daisy, if 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 something changes in Iowa. You know, he uh, DeSantis has gotten the Kim Reynolds endorsement. He's visited all 99 counties of Iowa. Uh, we have these Iowa caucuses. If it, there's plenty of time between now and that caucus for a something to go bad for Trump, and b something to go very well for DeSantis. If DeSantis were to pull a really close second, again, I don't know if that's possible, right? But that changes things, right? Totally. Listen, I you know I don't have a guy. I know people think that. I probably do. I just, I honestly don't at this point in the game. I know she's been pulling for DeSantis, but I am the kind of girl that I just don't trust polls. I've, I've never trusted them ever since the whole Hillary thing. Yeah. I have always been like, I don't trust any of the polls you show me. <laughs> I don't trust any of these people. So I wait until kind of the last minute till I've seen everybody debate. I like to see debates. In fact, I was a little upset that Trump didn't want to do debates yeah. because I would have liked to have seen that. I don't think anybody has it in the bag and I don't think that anybody's entitled to anything. I think you have to go through the process. Um, I like Trump. I think he did a great job the last time. Um, So I just I want to see how everything plays out and then I'll make my decision at the very end. And I don't trust polls and I'm not sure what's going to happen. And I just want to see how people, you know, what they do at the polls, because the American people have surprised me before. They surprised (laughs) me in 2022. Um, when everybody said, oh, there's going to be a red wave, yeah, you know, and yeah. there wasn't. And so right. who was I, not surprised? I was you, not surprised. You are oh. surprised by that. You're right. But a lot of people were. So I just I you just never know, Michelle. You yeah. just don't know. And so well, we were the also fat lady really, sings. Really, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're right. And we were very surprised in 2016. I, we yeah. were all told I was surprised had in the back right. and she, you know, she didn't. So right. it, it is it's an interesting time. Um but it's a, it's a scary time. And I think, um, so I'll finish with this. Cause I like to ask my guests, um, at the end of each conversation, what gives them hope? Uh, we are bereft of hope in this country right now. Maybe the uh, bereft, maybe is too strong a word where the hope bucket is, is getting lower in volume. And so mock, let's start with you. What, what gives you hope these days? Well, what gives what gives me hope is that there's still so much goodness in the world. And and I think one of the things that we try to do on our podcast every single day is shine a big fat spotlight on good stories. So Daisy does a segment at the end of the show that always features like some bit of positivity. You know, we try to play some videos at the end that also do the same thing that brings some levity to what has usually been a really dark discussion in many ways, because there's just a lot going wrong. Um, but the fact that there are, there's you, there are so many like-minded people out here. We know this. We talk to them every day. They're in our audience. Um, we're talking to you. So we know that just by virtue of there being strength in numbers, that there's reason to have hope because there's too many people that still have common sense, uh, to just feel completely hopeless. I, um, I, 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 yeah, you give I, me hope by saying that. I Go ahead, that. <laughs> I love that. No, I was just going to say, I'm going to say my, my 13 year old and her friends. Cause I mean, I, I think a lot of people think, Oh my God, this new generation, they're terrible. These kids are awful. And I disagree with that. I think there's a lot of hope for some of these younger kids that she loves God. She loves her friends. She loves her country. And, and she's no, she's not the exception. A lot of her friends are that way too. And so there's hope for these younger kids. There's hope as long as, you raise them right, I think, and you probably feel the same way, yeah. Michelle. I think that um, you know there's hope for some of these younger kids that we're passing the torch to some really good, good kids. Good kids are going to be good adults. 
you know? Well, you know, and uh, we have now Taylor Swift as person of Times Person Ugh. of the Year. I, <laughs> I don't know how to feel about that because some people think, oh, they're going to start to use her against the common good. They <laughs> will. Use her as a, we- a political weapon. and They she totally and will. <laughs> and then somebody else, my, my son read me this, this post on X or somewhere that said, if Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey get married and have children, it will start a renaissance of young people wanting to have that white picket fence. I don't know. It's an interesting argument. It is an interesting argument. Yeah, it is. Yeah. As long as they don't like have a bunch of liberal babies. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. I, 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 you know, again, I just like to think that there's this, whether you're on the left or on the right, that there's some core of common sense that yes. can come together as a co in a coalition of courage. I like to say, yes, do love the, that. Do the right thing. Do the right mm. thing. Agreed. Just agreed. Do the right thing. Absolutely. Ladies, chicks, it's always great to see you. <laughs> I can't wait to do it again. You're such a blast to talk to. And uh, let's see how the Ivy League presidents where they are in the next. 12 months or so, or Amen maybe even to that. two. Interesting. We'll see. <laughs> yes. All right. As I say at the end of every podcast, folks, um, and I, these two women are perfect examples of being brave and doing good. So be brave. Have a little courage and do something good today. Just one little tiny little thing. Good to go along. <laughs> All right. Thank and we'll you. See you next. We'll see you next time.